think the Club Rio wine is always very consistent in style. It's always got a firm structure, very silky tannins, very beautiful colors, and the aromas are always focused on black fruits mostly, with a hint of spices, and it's always very balanced. This is what I like the most, probably, that the consistency, whatever the vintage, whatever you got during your season, you always have those uh, specific features for this wine. Including the first cru and the village level, I would say it's about five. Five hectares of vines among the 600 hectares of uh, the Gevray Chambertin appellation. So it's not large at all. And the specificity of uh, the Cloprieur is actually, it's divided into two parts. The higher level was uh, classified in uh, 1936, as well as the lower part, uh, which was in a uh, village appellation. Just a path separates the two. It's hard for me to tell because from what I do, um, it's, it's not arrogant at all, but I don't see that much differences. Um, it's hard for me during a blind tasting, for example, to say that's a village and that's a premier cru because depending on the estate, depending on the way of working, it's very hard to make a difference. Uh, of course, a wine professional does but uh, I'm, I'm more wine lover than a specific uh, professional taster. So um, in my case, it's hard to, to make really a difference. This site is always a bit cooler compared, for, compared to La Justice, for example. La Justice is um, next to um, the house of Avenue de la Gare, where is the domain. So as a consequence, um, it just cut off the wind coming from the south. And La Justice is always very early because of that. Here, at Cloprieur site, we are surrounded by Mazy Chambertin and we, we got uh, Chapelle uh, Chambertin um, just at the south. So that's, that's a wonderful area, but it's much more impacted by the, by the winds, by, uh, you know, the, the the cold here and everything. And uh, we can see the Comblavo just right here. So it always got a, a nice um, air flu. But for this reason as well, it's always a bit later compared to some other sites. The claw is a witness of the feudal time, actually, um, coming from the Middle Age, because um, it designated some uh, seigneurial vines which were surrounded by walls. And uh, it was created among other reasons because of the Bon des Vendanges, the time where you were allowed to pick which was already uh, in place at this time. The claw was an exception because this rule was not applying to the vine uh, closed by walls. So they had uh, an additional freedom to pick whenever they wanted to. So that's very interesting. And uh, regarding the name itself, we know that uh, um, the site was owned by uh, the Abbey of Cluny and the prayer was the owner 
So he just gave uh, the name to this site, Clos Prieur. The soil of the Clos Prieur is mostly composed with clay, limestone, uh, some uh, ferruginous elements, and uh, we do have a perfect stoniness, including one of the best clay of the coast. And this is why uh, this specific place is classified and recognized as the best place in a village level from the uh, Gevray Chambertin area. It really got a uh, lot of top stones and the soils are very well drained. And it's east exposure, so rising sun, which uh, were supposed to be the best from the monks as well. Regarding the village level, what I do, I can clearly see a difference between even my uh, other villages. I'm not saying it's uh, better, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing a classification, but for sure it got much more complexity than the other village level I used to try. It's much more intense. Um, it really got a, a specific structure, very intense, very long, very complex. That's the reason why I, I told it's hard for me to make the difference between the village and the first crew, because there's not a lot of uh, differences for me between those two. So, of course, we, we do harvest uh, with uh, pickers. We don't have any machine, of course, but that makes sense. And uh, my pickers are coming since uh, 10, 15, 20 years for some of them. So they know exactly what they have to, to cut and what they have to drop. So for this reason, I do not have any sorting table at all. They do the sorting directly into the vines which is much more qualitative to me because you never mix together the good grapes with the bad ones. So that's really something I like because of course it takes longer in the vines, but as a consequence, the crop which is coming next here is ready to go, ready to be processed. So that's, that's a lot of, um, of saving of time and even more important of quality. And you are not treating, you know, the grapes, so you do not have uh, any um, damaged grapes and juice, uh, you know, dropping. So when the grapes arrive, it's just perfectly clean and uh, intact. This is what I like the most. And then uh, we de-steam. So it's 100% distilled for all the cuvee that we do. And then it goes into the stainless steel tank. And because of the quality of our distiller, we have plenty of um, wool berries. So it's like if we were doing a kind of, uh, of uh, wool cluster, but without the stalks. And that's just perfect for me because we do have this kind of uh, enzymatic fermentation before it starts into the berries. I do not make any uh, cold maceration. I really want to try to keep as much as possible the natural temperature of the grapes when it came. Of course, if it's really warm, I'm going to use a chiller, but otherwise I don't. So the temperature for um, encuvage uh, used to be between 8 degrees like in 2008 and it can rise to 16 like uh, in 19, it really depends. But uh, I, I like this because this is going to have a big influence on how, um, how long the fermentation is going to start. It can take two days, Prior fermentation, if it's higher, 
it can take six days if it's cooler and I like that because it's always different and it's really a feature of the vintage again. When the fermentation starts, um, of course I do not add anything, no dry yeast, no, no analogical product anyway. And so when it starts, I used to do an alternance of uh, pump over and uh, punch down by foot. On SE, the punch down on the uh, solar years, I'm not making as much because uh, you can have a uh, too fast and too strong extraction and I don't want it. I want to work my cap of course because uh, it's needed but I don't want to over extract as well. So mostly pump over those last years which were very warm. And once the sugar is gonna be um, over dry we're gonna gently press. I got a wonderful pneumatic press and um, I used to have the smoother program as I can to not have those harsh tannins I've been avoiding during the process before. So most of the time I, I turn off before it finish and I, I check you know the, the humidity into the into the skins and I I'm like okay we, we are done we're gonna stop and this way we just have the best juice and the best uh, Tannins, very silky, very ripened ones, and um, this is what I'm really looking for. I don't care really about the quantity. Of course, I care, but not at this stage. And uh, then I'm gonna leave um, the wine about two days before putting it into barrels. And for the barrels, it depends, but most of the time I do 50% new, 50% one year old. And I just have a wonderful balance because the, the wine I produce are always very solid wine, so they just digest all the all the oak. Of course, it seems to be a bit high for village level, but I just doing 11 months in barrels. So finally, you know the amount of new and the uh, elvage time just combines perfectly. And at the bottling time, the wines are all in balance. The elvage doesn't show at all. And we have wines which are, I would say, ready to drink immediately because it's that good. It's so explosive. It's so, you know, vibrant and yes, very ready to go. Dad always crafted very, very good wines, but we didn't work with the same vintages, so it's hard to make a comparison because the elements were really different. He was working with, you know, the vintages in Burgundy. I mean, uh, most of the time it was not sunny, it was mostly rainy. Um, in the past, they had a lot of uh, issue with the disease and uh, the rot and the ripeness itself. Today, it's the reverse. We almost have to fight against the other ripeness. So, very different. But the cloprier he made were always very elegant, by the way. Maybe not as concentrated as now because of the vintages again, but always very solid wines, very spicy, with a beautiful, beautiful body and beautiful length, that's for sure. But it was expressing on a different way. Um, I will say it was also maybe requiring um, a little bit more time to really express. So wines from today, because of the warm vintages, are much more um, ready to go quite soon compared to the previous vintages. Decades. Wow, that's a tough question. I love all of them, really. Um, I, I still have them in memory, like kids, you know. You know exactly your kids and you know your, their character. That's the same for me for the Cloprier, so it's hard for me to make a statement, but um, I really, really loved um, the 2009 
it was one of the favorite vintage of my dad as well. It's not the reason why I'm loving it, but it was so majestuous, you know. Um, the wine was really intense without being heavy, just balanced and ripe and uh, always good at any time, whatever you enjoyed, you know, from the end of the bottling or one year, five years later, it was always good. It still got some uh, time to go. I wish I would, uh, I would had some left, but uh, it's gone. Maybe that got some uh, secret bottles of it somewhere in the cellar, but I don't know. But uh, the potential was great on this one, that's for sure. So I wish I could try it again, just to see how it is now. Another vintage I like for the Club Prieur was, um, was uh, 15. Uh, about for the same reasons. I think it was very balanced, very pure, very generous, but always, always so elegant and balanced. Call me the joker, call me the fool, when she calls